Alabama athletic director Greg Burns said to give him 72 hours to, to hire Nick Saban's replacement. He needed only 48 hours. Kalen DeBoer hired last week from Washington to be Nick Saban's heir. What a challenge it will be, but what an accomplished coach it just hired. Welcome into SEC Football Unfiltered, our podcast from the USA Today Network. I'm Blake Topmeyer alongside John Adams. Of course, the big news last week that Nick Saban is retiring after a career that featured seven national championships, six of which occurred at Alabama. And Alabama hires one of the coaches who was in the national championship game just this past season, Kalen DeBoer from Washington, career record of 104 and 12, just 12 losses in nine seasons as a coach across various levels. Of course, he's never coached in the SEC before. That's an obvious storyline here. But Alabama is a program that hates losing, and it just hired a coach who almost never loses. Meanwhile, Nick Saban will have, quote, 100% access to the program still, end quote. That's what Kalen DeBoer said at his introduction on Saturday. So, John, I want to uh, I want to get with you in a moment on what we think of this idea of Saban still lurking around um, if, with the Alabama program. Is this going to be an asset? Is it going to be a hindrance or otherwise? But first, let's start with what you think of the hire. Uh, you know what I think of this hire. I've been saying uh, really since the moment Saban retired that I thought Kalen DeBoer should be at the top of Alabama's list. What did you think of, of where Alabama landed in this search? Well, obviously, Greg Byrne consulted with you before making the hire. That's that's Certainly. that's pretty much the word on the street. And so, congratulations, you got your guy. Now let's see how he does. Uh, it's hard to argue with that record. It's uh, it's so sterling. You you know some of these places are way off the college football map, but yeah that you're dealing with like competition uh, programs with similar resources. Anytime I look at a coach football or basketball, who's won at various levels, junior college division two, and he always wins. Uh, you can't ask for more. I was a little, I would like to have a guy maybe with experience recruiting in the sec, but maybe that doesn't matter as much in the transfer portal. Uh, because guys just come from all over the place. They're moving in, moving out. So maybe that doesn't matter. Uh, and so, yeah, I certainly don't disapprove for the uh, of the hire, as if Alabama cares whether I did or didn't. Uh, so I think, uh, yeah, I think it made a good move. And one thing I do like about it, there seemed to be no, uh, you know, no consideration, oh, you have to get an Alabama guy. I cringe when I hear any school say, well, you got to get one of our own, bring them back home. They know what it's like here. <laughs> You're looking for somebody to win games. And I'm also getting a little tired, even though I used to say it some myself, not a good fit. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's, he's from South Dakota. Uh, he coached at Fresno State. Uh, I travel a lot. There's nothing in common between Fresno and South Dakota, Sioux Falls, or anywhere in South Dakota. Say, and then he goes to Washington. Nothing similar between Fresno and, and Washington State. So, no, that shouldn't be a problem. I think Alabama came out of this about as well as it could have. Yeah, there was a, what I thought was kind of a humorous moment in uh, the breakout session with reporters on Saturday, Kalen DeBoer had an introductory press conference at Alabama uh, Saturday afternoon. And then after that, off camera, he had a on the record breakout session with reporters. And someone asked the obvious question about DeBoer not having experience in the South uh, or the SEC. And DeBoer's answer was, well, I'm not a West Coast guy either, either with the implication obviously being, look at just how much I won at Washington and I'm not from out there either. Right. And now it's, it's a different, it's a different animal in the sec. We know that I, I didn't take it as DeBoer saying otherwise, but I thought it was just a great line of, yeah, this is a guy from South Dakota, you know, just a few years ago, 
uh, he was coaching in NAIA, NAIA Sioux Falls. And next thing you know, he's winning a Pac-12 championship, uh, getting to the national championship game with Washington, uh, which is not exactly his backyard either. And, and we've already seen at DeBoer's coaching staff start to take shape. It's going to have a lot of Washington flavor. Uh, however, it's it's also going to have, you know, a few faces familiar with recruiting in the SEC. Very importantly, uh, his offensive coordinator, Ryan Grubb, who is, at him, who is with him at Washington, has been with him uh, before that. They, they kind of go way back, uh, an integral part of what Kalen DeBoer does. He is following him to Alabama to be Alabama's offensive coordinator. I think that is an upgrade at at least that position for Alabama as compared to what they had. Uh, to your point on recruiting, John, uh, I'm curious your your reaction to this because I've, I've been thinking how much does SEC matter versus not uh, SEC experience. I've always looked at it as like a bonus and not a requirement to have SEC experience. And I'm starting to think that that bonus is maybe worth a little bit less than before. My theory being that recruiting is more transactional than ever. With NIL, um, I don't think that it's 100% money talks, but as with someone like you or I accepting a job, money factors into the equation. So I think mo money matters more than ever in recruiting. I think the transfer portal matters more than ever. I think the whole thing is maybe a little bit ever so slightly less relationship oriented and more so transaction oriented, which to me kind of waters down a little bit of that bonus of having experience recruiting the area. How do you see that, you know, as NIL versus relationships and, and knowing all the coaches and knowing all the key players in a particular terrain? Yeah, I think that's a good observation, Blake. It's, uh, and we can certainly speak to that in our business. I know guys that have moved for a ten dollar a week raise in our yeah. business. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and and I've been all over the map. So uh, yeah, it, it, it's a it's more of a business. I mean, we keep saying that, but that's the reality of it. It's about money. And you mentioned it used to be establishing relationships. Establishing relationships took time, and I think continuity mattered more. So when you're talking about a staff, you start recruiting somebody in the ninth grade or they go to your summer camp and you've known them for a while. The recruit gets to know you, feel really comfortable. Okay, well, you've got that comfort zone, but then comes somebody comes in there and shows you a check that's signed. And that kind of trumps the familiarity. I mean, I've had coaches tell me this. It, you go into a, a recruit's living room. Now the family is, rather than being uh, wondering, okay, let's check out this guy's personality. How am I going? How will he take care of my our son? Uh, now it's kind of how's he going to take care of us? Because. Uh, we're going to get a part of that check. And I, I think it matter. I think you're right. I think it matters less than it used to. I was interested to see how Alabama would handle Saturday's introduction of Kalen DeBoer, because you have this very rare situation where the previous coach has not either been fired or, uh, resigned in shame or moved on for a better job or something. You know, it's, it's, it's uncommon where the previous coach hangs it up, everybody loved him, uh, is still in the good graces. It's not, I, I wouldn't say it's never happened before, but it doesn't happen often this way. And so I thought, you know, Saban didn't have a press conference to announce his retirement. He, his only interview to this point had been the sit down with ESPN. So I thought, are they going to have Saban come up and say a few words? Is he going to take any questions? Is he even going to be there? Like those were my biggest questions as I was driving to cover the introductory presser at Tuscaloosa. And what Alabama did, Saban and his wife, Miss Terry, were there. However, they did not have them sit on stage. You know, they had the president and the AD and whatever, uh, and the new coach, coach's wife, sit on stage. Saban and, and, and his wife were not on stage. They were seated in the front row. 
And Saban did not make any remarks. He didn't take questions, didn't, you know, didn't even have an opening statement. He was there uh, as a supporter, a luminary, whatever you want to call him, but he wasn't part of the proceedings. And I thought the symbol of the, the symbol of symbolism, excuse me, of that was probably intentional. If you have Saban on stage, then quite literally, he would be lurking over the shoulder of, of, of Kalen DeBoer at that point. So I, I don't know that that's the best symbolism to put him over the shoulder of your new coach. So instead, he's in the crowd, and he and DeBoer are looking eye to eye, and, and DeBoer handled it well. You know, he led the crowd at one point in a round of applause to uh, for Saban's career, what he's achieved. He struck the right notes of gratitude and appreciation. But all that aside, really, I thought the important question is, what is Saban's role and involvement going to be in the program here forward or, or lack thereof? And Kalen DeBoer said that Saban has, quote, 100 percent access, OK, to everything. He says, I would be a fool if that wasn't the case. I'm going to ask that he shows up and gives me at least one thing every day, basically one thing that he sees uh, that can help Kalen DeBoer. Now, What's Nick Saban's role going to be? I asked Greg Byrne that question. Byrne said he's going to be uh, in an advisory role without elaborating beyond that. So that could mean any number of things, right? I, I think it's important to note that Nick Saban's office will not be in the same building as Kalen DeBoer's office. Kalen DeBoer will be working out of the football facility. Saban's office shifts to Bryant-Denny Stadium. So physically speaking, there will be about a mile distance in between them. Does that matter? Uh, it doesn't sound like much, but I do think that is probably a better scenario than uh, your predecessors got connecting doors with your <laughs> office, right? At least now they're a mile apart. But we've seen situations, John, and you've seen it better than most, having covered Tennessee for as long as you have, where the old coach is looming large, quite literally, in the background of a situation and how that goes. Um, I'm not saying it's going to be a repeat of the situation at Tennessee, but do you see this as an asset, as a hindrance, uh, as just a, well, Saban's probably not going to be around as much as Alabama's letting on anyway. How do you look at this situation of new coach there saying that old coach has 100% access? Um, a year from now, what happened in the press conference will be of no relevance. But I think symbolism at this point matters. Uh, symbolism with Nick Saban is in a building way over here. Uh, Kalen DeBoer is in a building in the football building. Uh, I think Saban being in the audience with his wife, Terry, says, I approve of this hire. We're all on board here. It's one big team. If you put him up there... On the dais with the coach, it's like, <laughs> well, yeah, he's the coach, but I'm Nick Saban. So, uh, and it's nothing like Tennessee. If you go back to Philip Fulmer's athletic director, uh, I don't even know if he was looking over the shoulder. It was like he was right in the middle of everything. He was out there on the practice field, dressed in coaching attire, blowing a whistle and playing coach again watching video, coaching the offensive line. I I expected him at some point to just line up and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of those offensive linemen or hold a dummy or something. Uh, I won't – there, there's a punch line set up there holding a dummy, but I won't use it. Uh, so I think uh, – so I think it's completely different. And how will it – it's also, I think, different – I can go back. I remember John Wooden at UCLA. Uh, when Gene Bartow succeeded John Wooden, uh, very successful coach, Gene Bartow, but it was very difficult. Uh, John Wooden had an office right there. Nick Saban, as great a coach as he is, greatest of all time, he's called, in football. John Wooden, greatest of all time in basketball. But, <laughs> I mean, he won all the time. I mean, he must have won, I, I don't remember, nine cha national championships or something. It was as though he never lost. I think it was a harder act to follow. Uh, in this case, I don't see Nick Saban. I see him investing in his new role. And I think he's already, from what I've been told, 
uh, served as a consultant to Alabama, to administrators, to hire, hire up people with that university because they value his opinion on things, on his, his famous, the process. Well, he says that a lot, but also he is extremely organized. And I'm not sure uh, a lot of administrators are as organized as he is. So I see it. I don't see it as a as being a bad thing for Kalen DeBoer. Uh, I just think even if Nick Saban wasn't there, he's still following Nick Saban. So to me, it it won't be that big a deal. I agree. I think that the pressure is wrapped up in the fact that whether Saban was literally on campus or not, he's still coming after Saban and he has all the pressures that come with that. I don't know of uh, that Saban being an advisory role to the athletic department a mile away from Kalen DeBoer. I, I don't know that that adds significantly more pressure. I don't know that that makes his job more difficult. You could argue it makes his job one ounce easier to have open access to Saban if he wants it. And maybe I'm naive in thinking this, but with these two individuals, I think the boundaries will be appropriate. I, I think it's important that Alabama hired someone who's had success, who's got experience. This isn't a kid they brought in. This is a 49-year-old coach who's had success at multiple stops, uh, who I think seems comfortable in his own skin. Like I think there will be boundaries to the program. I know De- DeBoer's saying the right things of 100% access you know, I don't, I don't know if I believe that. Is saving to be able to walk into the middle of a team meeting and say, "Well, I'm running this show now." I don't, I don't see that. But I don't think Saban's going to want to either. And and sticking with the Philip Fulmer example, um, I, I, I think it's a stretch to compare them. Uh, it's it's relevant because of the situations, but maybe not because of the individuals, which you've pointed out. And and one other difference, Fulmer was fired as coach. Right, he was forced out. He never wanted to stop being the coach. <laughs> Saban wasn't forced out. This was his decision to retire. Now, I think it may be a decision that he internally wrestles with for a long time. Did he make the right call? Did he not? But that's something with him to deal with. That wasn't him getting forced out and thinking uh, that they never should have got rid of him in in the first place. And also, Saban, as has been well reported now, has this uh, multi-million dollar beach home uh, out on Florida's Atlantic coast. I mean, if he's going to be using that at all, he's not going to be hanging around the football program 24 seven through 65. Right. So I think that this situation could work um, where the old coach is still in a role on campus. It's not the only time we've ever seen that happen. The expectations are obviously going to be overwhelming facing Kalen DeBoer. It was interesting, John, I listened to, the Paul Feinbaum show, uh, the Friday show, so the, the day DeBoer was hired, uh, that hiring came just as the Feinbaum show was about to start. So you had four hours reacting to the DeBoer hire. And I would say the callers were split into two camps. Uh, about half thought that Alabama screwed this up. And those callers all thought they, that Alabama should have hired one person, Lane Kiffin. They weren't all across the map in who Alabama should have hired. Those fans who weren't thrilled with this hire unanimously thought that Alabama should have instead hired Lane Kiffin. The other camp, though, which was probably at least 50% of the callers that were Alabama fans, really liked the hire. Their expectations are that he's going to be a phenomenal coach at Alabama. One one caller even said, well, when all is said and done, Alan DeBoer could be better than Nick Saban. And I thought, oh, mercy. <laughs> Talk about setting a high bar. But that was sort of the mood from those Alabama fans that were liking this hire, which I guess better that than, you know, DeBoer facing the camp of folks who thinks that Alabama got it wrong. But even the people that, that got it right, that, that think Alabama got it right, they're going to be applying a lot of pressure on Kalen DeBoer. So how much runway does he have here? How long does he have? until this proud program and its fan base, its passionate fans, are going to expect Kalen DeBoer to do what his predecessor did, which was win national championships. How much runway does he have before Alabama fans are going to think he needs to be hoisting the trophy on top of the sport? Uh, He'll have until next fall 
Um, year year one, they'll expect a championship. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. Sure. I mean, Alabama most preseason top twenty five polls have Alabama in the top five. There you go. Just signed the number one recruiting class. Yes, they'll lose some guys to the portal, um, but I think the expectations will be extraordinarily high. Um, rebuilding is now out of the college football lexicon. It's just uh, nobody ever says that anymore. Well, some be, some do foolishly because the fan reaction is, well, let's get rid of this guy right now. If we're going to have to wait, if we're going to have to wait for five years. Can you imagine Kalen DeBoer saying, hey, you know, once I get my system installed here, and he, Kalen DeBoer has to know that. Uh, as far as the uh, Lane Kiffin thing goes, there's a certain segment of fans that will always love Lane Kiffin because of his personality, his persona, a coach like that, uh, Steve Spurrier. I'm sure there's some Florida fans who still want Steve Spurrier back in there. And Steve Spurrier is not going to be, well, guys, I'm too old to do that job. If you ask him, he would probably say, well, yeah, I don't, I don't think I want to get back in it, but I think he, what he I golf part time and coach the other part of the time, maybe yeah. he would. Yeah. No, I just think he was so successful, but there's something about the same reason fans don't like Lane Kiffin or the same reason the fans, if he's your coach, love him that play works He's signaling touchdown when the guy's 10 yards downfield or he's pumping his fist. Basically, him say his saying, I call that play. Mm -hmm. I did it. There you go. And so I can see his attraction. And it, I mean, if he if Alabama would have hired Lane Kiffin, I would have said, okay, this probably will work. Uh, but I think Kalen DeBoer will, will too. The expectation's high. And for the guy who said, well, who's to say he won't do better than Nick Saban? Imagine when Bear Bryant, and I remember this, when Bear Bryant retired, he unfortunately lived only a short time thereafter. But when he retired, six national championships at Alabama also. And that was in about a 24-year period. Uh, do you think anybody thought Alabama would ne ever hire a coach that win six national titles? I don't think so. And so they did, they did manage to do that. So maybe there's another a legend waiting to happen there at Alabama. But one of the other things I like about it, I didn't mention this earlier, Blake, but when we talk about those Saban is not on staff, he's at the university in some ways, there's some co compatibility there background wise both guys came from rural states uh Saban from West Virginia uh DeBoer from South Dakota and also I think it's nice that DeBoer is an offensive guy and Nick Saban's a defensive guy so if Nick Saban were an offensive guy he's going uh and he could step in and say why are you running three wide there right I, I mean point. that's that yeah that's where you bring in the tight end no, with defense, I mean, if I were in Kalen DeBoer, um, Kalen DeBoer's shoes, I would say, Nick, what, what don't you like about my offense? Is it from a defensive perspective? I think Saban could be a great resource for him, and, and I think it could be more of an asset. But expectations, sky high right away. That's a really good point about them having different areas of expertise and how that, that could be beneficial to DeBoer and, and maybe not getting second guessed as often by the, the previous coach. And I think Saban's other area of expertise in addition to defense, maybe his really his secret sauce, I think was his recruiting prowess. And in, and in that area, he could be an asset to Kalen DeBoer as well as he, you know, jumps into the shark infested, shark infested waters that is SEC recruiting. I was looking back at your power rankings John, that you did um, right as the season was ending, I believe these published right after the national championship. You did your your 2024 SEC power rankings. Uh, you were one of the first to put your 
quote unquote, too early power rankings out there. And, you know, at the time, you didn't know Nick Saban was retiring. So this was done uh, with Nick Saban in mind. It was also done before any of these now Alabama transfer portal defections occurred. Uh, most notable, Isaiah Bond, the uh, one of Alabama's best receivers this past year, the guy who caught the pass to win the Iron Bowl to allow Alabama to even make the playoff. He quickly entered the portal uh, after Saban's announcement of retirement. So you've got a couple players on their way out. Even more notably, you got the coach on the way out. And I wondered how that might affect your power ranking. So as a reminder, you had Georgia number one, Alabama two, followed by Texas, Ole Miss at four, and Tennessee at five. I wouldn't have had much argument with your one through five pecking order. Uh, I wouldn't have changed anything about one through four. I would have considered Tennessee for five. I probably would have considered a, a few other teams, as I'm sure you did. Uh, but now, with Saban out of the picture, would you shake up your SEC power rankings at all? Or if you were to republish your power rankings tomorrow, would you still have Georgia one, Alabama two? I uh, still have Georgia one. And, and I I knew the – I don't remember if they'd already said they were – they were leaving, but I assumed that Brock Bowers and Lad McConkey would be gone. Uh, so those are key losses, of course, for Georgia. Uh, but I still really like Georgia, uh, really like Kirby Smart. Uh, now I would probably have Texas second. And it's not so much – and then I would, I would put Alabama third. I wouldn't drop it lower than that. But uh, Isaiah Bond doesn't – that doesn't – terribly impact me he was a good receiver for Alabama this past year but it's not like you lost Devontae Smith uh, my concern would be how well does Jalen Milrow fit this offense Alabama when you go back to their struggles early on against uh, uh with with the quarterback situation uh even benched Jalen Milrow for game three brought him back and really built the offense around him um, I assume Kalen DeBoer will do the same thing, that he will tweak his offense. But I guess just the fact I look at Michael Penix, uh, that great receiving core Washington had, and those, those timing routes and everything kind of clicking, completely different with Jalen Milrow. Uh, so there's a little uncertainty there. It's not huge, but I have to think about that because college football now is so quarterback-oriented. I think uh, one thing that interests me, you mentioned Milrow, Washington took a lot of deep shots with Michael Penix. That's that's one thing he did he did well, not necessarily in the national championship game, but for most of the season, stretching the field, he had really good wide receivers, but stretching the field was a strength of this Kalen DeBoer, Ryan Grubb offense with Michael Penix as the engineer of it on the field. Well, What's one thing Jalen Milrow for most of the season, not against Michigan, a common theme there, right? Uh, but Michigan aside, Jalen uh, Milrow threw a really good deep ball. That was one of, in addition to his running ability, those downfield shots were one of his best weapons. So, um, you know, I think that could be a good match of, of DeBoer's obviously someone who likes their, his quarterback to take shots downfield, who schemes up opportunities for that. And we've got Jalen Milrow. That's one of the tricks in his bag. Um, okay, so you have Alabama falling just one spot in your power rankings. That says to me then, would it be a fair interpretation to say your expectation, not the fans' expectations, uh, but your expectations for Kalen DeBoer in year one would be to make the college football playoff start for starters? Do you think they need to win a game in the playoff? I, I, judging by your power rankings, you're not saying – Okay, you got to win a national championship in year one, coach. But you're saying if you got him three in the power rankings, you're saying that the, that he should make the playoffs. Do you think he needs to win a game, or where do you draw the line on your your year one expectations for DeBoer? I think there's a it's just a a big gap in making the playoff and not making the playoff. And certainly you want to win a game, but I I think if he makes the playoff, I would be satisfied with that. One thing we haven't really talked about, and I don't think fans think about it 
so much because everybody's really gung ho about this 12 team playoff. I am too. But as we know from playoffs where the NFL playoffs are underway, the team that was best during the regular season doesn't always win that playoff game. Uh, Dallas just got hammered by green Bay in the playoff. Those things will happen in the college football playoffs. So, uh, fans need to buckle up for that. But I, I do think if you make the playoff, you're fine. And it was interesting when you were talking about the offense, I was thinking Washington's personnel, not as familiar with it as, uh, as Alabama's personnel, but saw it in the playoffs. When I look at offense, Washington's offense this past season compared to Alabama's uh, in almost every area, I take Washington. I like its offensive line better. Dylan Johnson, he wasn't full strength to the for the last game, but for the championship. But I I like him better than Alabama's running backs, and I certainly liked Washington's receivers better than Alabama's. Uh, Milrow and Penix are such different quarterbacks, but I'd still take Penix. So it's as like uh, it's as though DeBoer is traded down in offense. All right, on our way out the door here, John, I want to hit you with a few factor fiction scenarios. Uh, let's start with fact or fiction. Kalen DeBoer will win at least one national championship at Alabama. <laughs> I'll say fiction. You don't think he wins one, okay? Mm. You what do you say? You, you hesitated for a long time. Oh, so yeah, you, it's a tough yeah. call. I, yeah. I, think, I think it's going to be harder to win a national championship now. I agree. The best programs because you go through that gauntlet in the playoffs. So even if you get a bye, you, I, I still, yeah, I think it will be more difficult. And uh, I expect him to win a lot of games. But uh, – George is the number one program in the SEC right now, even though it didn't win the SEC championship. And Kirby Smart doesn't appear to be going anywhere. So, uh, yeah. I, I agree with everything you said. It's just this was my hire, right? Yeah. I mean, well, you, Greg I, Bird, yes. credit, but I mean, it was really my hire. I, I was the one putting it out there from day one. <laughs> Stand by well. your man. Stand That's by right. your coach. I have to. So I'm going to say fact: he wins at least one national championship. Now, even though this is my hire. Uh, I'm not going to go as far as that fine bomb caller and say that he's going to have a better career than Nick Saban. I won't. I won't go that far. That just is we're trending into to lunacy. But I'll say fact that he wins at least one national championship at, at Alabama. Uh, and in seriousness, I mean that, that we both think he's a good coach. I, you know, neither one of us is sitting here saying like, oh no way. Neither one of us thinks the guy's going to be an absolute bust and fall on his face. Uh, it doesn't no. Um Okay, fact or fiction. Uh, and, and your first answer may weigh into this or, or not. I don't know. Um, fact or fiction, Kalen DeBoer will be Alabama's coach for at least five seasons. Fact. Okay. So you think he's not going to get all the way across the finish line, but he's going to win enough, make enough playoff appearances, have them knocking on the door enough that, that he's there for a while. Is that a fair interpretation? Yes. yes. Uh-huh. Okay. Um Fact or fiction, and this one goes beyond Kalen DeBoer, now, who, whoever's the coach at Alabama. In the next 10 years, Alabama will either have the most playoff appearances of an SEC team or the second most playoff appearances. So I'm saying one team could have more playoff appearances than them, and it would still be a fact. The fiction answer would be if you believe at least two SEC teams will have more playoff appearances than Alabama in the next 10 years. I, I know that's a, it's a difficult word. You, to that you feel, yeah, <laughs> you feel me. Uh, I think two other teams will have more. Okay, so that makes it fiction. Gotcha. Would you like to say your teams, maybe it's more than two teams? Uh, do, are, are you, I, I, I'm, 
I'm taking the field there. Taking the Again, field. going back to how I think it's harder. It will be harder for an established program to win a national championship than it was in the previous system, the playoff yeah. system. So, yeah. Yeah, I would agree with you. I, I would say – uh, my strangely worded fact or fiction here leads this to be a fiction answer. I think, I think more than one program will have more playoff appearances than Alabama over the next 10 years. Of course, there's a necessary caveat here. Who knows what the college football playoff will look like even five years from now, right? Uh, <laughs> will, will we even recognize the, the playoff? Uh, how many teams will be in it? Hard, hard to say. But um, I, I'll give you one more. John, and we'll, we'll close this. I'll try to word this one a little better than the last, where it was confusing as to what you, whether you're supposed to say fact or fiction. Uh, fact or fiction, Texas is in better shape right now with its momentum coming off uh, appearance in the semifinals with Star Steve Sarkeesian as its coach. Texas is in the better position than Alabama, with Kalen DeVore, fact or fiction? I would say fact, simply because he's had a head start. He's proved to be a great recruiter. He's a really good offensive coach, as is Kalen DeVore. And uh, going back, looking ahead to next season, offensive line's better than Alabama's. Uh, I think his quarterback's a little better. Uh, and he's got a really good running back, a better running back than Alabama. So I'm thinking kind of short term right now. But yeah, I would say Texas. And the thing you got to love about Texas, NIL. No yep. shortcomings there. No doubt about it. That will be one of the challenges for Kalen DeBoer of the many challenges that he will face at Alabama. But he's seeing it as a great opportunity. Uh, he's running toward the moment here of being Nick Saban's successor. Saban uh, still around in that advisory role. It is the story of the football offseason. I'm sure we will have more to say on it uh, in the coming weeks, but that'll do it for now. Thanks for listening to this edition of SEC Football Unfiltered.